Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, uh, continuing our uh, presentation uh, for our Sabbath school. And uh, let's begin with a prayer before we go on into details. Uh, the Lord, thank you again for uh, this opportunity that we can come and, and be able to study your word. Lord, uh, bless us in this presentation, including our technical staff that we may be able to continue on without a glitch. Please uh, be with us as we discuss, Lord, and uh, uh, that will, you know, uh, help us in our growth spiritually with you. Uh, that we may be able to uh, mature in the blessings of this lesson that uh, we're going to discuss. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so our discussion is exciting way to get involved. <laughs> Excitement. And uh, third quarter 2020, lesson number 10, August 29, September 4. So uh, here uh, we are going to deal with uh, a few introductions and then uh, small groups, God's idea first. And Monday, small groups in scripture uh, organized for service. And then the New Testament small groups principle. And then small group, the dynamics. And uh, summary uh, towards the end. So uh, it is exciting to know in the Sabbath here that uh, 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 in some parts of the world, you know, so during this week, we are going to focus in our discussion uh, for small groups and you will discover some exciting way for you to get involved. Throughout the Bible, small groups are highlighted as one of God's method in strengthening our faith, increasing our knowledge of his word, deepening our prayer life, and equipping us to witness. Uh, so in some parts of the world, small groups form the basis of spiritual nurture and outreach for the church. In other parts of the world, there are few, if any, small groups in local congregation. Small groups are described throughout scriptures in a variety of ways. And although they are outlined in Exodus as part of Moses' organizational plan for Israel, they are major focus in the New Testament witness, both in the ministry of Jesus and his first century church. Small groups serve multiple functions in the Bible and not all organized the same way. There are variety of types of groups. Some are primarily nurture groups uh, that emphasizes prayer and Bible study. Other groups are more witness and outreach focused and still others provide Christian fellowship and problem solving. The most common feature of the scripture is that small groups blend the following, prayer, Bible study, fellowship, and witness. Successful small groups that are sustainable must have all the four of this, these four elements. Okay. Small groups that fail to have mission focus often do not survive very long. Small groups with only mission focus and little or no prayer Bible or Bible study and fellowship often burn out their members in ceaseless activity. In this week's lesson, we will take a brief look at the Old Testament small groups, but we will spend most of our time carefully surveying Jesus' method in developing small groups and the dynamic multifaceted small. So the immediate context of this Text here in Matthew 9, 37 to 38, where he said, you know, the, the harvest, it's, the harvest is full, but you know, uh, the, 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 the reaper are few. So the immediate context in, of this text in Matthew 9, 37 and 38 is that exciting, the immediate uh, text uh, about Chapter 8 and 9 of Matthew are good news about healing miracles. Chapter 8 talks about healing the man with leprosy, the faith of the centurion asking Jesus to help heal his servant who is paralyzed. 
Jesus heals many like healing Peter's mother-in-law, who and many who were demon-possessed, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. It talks about Jesus comes the storm and the healing of two demon-possessed men. He heals a paralytic, uh, forgiving his sins first and told him to get up and walk. He heals the paralytic. And then Matthew also talks about the tax collector. And said, Jesus said, follow him. Much more, Matthew thought about the resurrection of the dead girl and the healing uh, of the sick woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. Jesus was referring to the girl who is, he said, the girl is not dead but asleep. And he uh, hold him by his, her hand and uh, let him go, uh, walk up. So Jesus also heals two blind men by touching their eyes. And Matthew mentioned about man who was demon possessed and could not talk. And when demon was driven out of the man who had been mute for many of us since many years, spoke. The immediate context is full of healings. Jesus makes men whole, great again. It, it, it is full of excitement, and at the end of this chapter 9, Jesus told his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So uh, it is exciting to way to get involved in church growth and preaching the gospel. Small groups. Small groups are biblical. Uh, God has uh, uh, chosen small groups to strengthen our faith and help us understand his word better, boast our praying habits, and teach us how to witness. So, this morning, we are going to talk in details about the examples of small groups. The first small group in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then we are going to uh, discuss being part of small groups, its organization and the dynamics and so, uh, on Sunday's lesson, God's idea, small groups is God's idea first. You know the story in Genesis 1, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, in the beginning, God created. And in verse 26, uh, uh, he said, let us make man in our image. Paul also mentions about in the ancient times in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, but it uh, says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed ear of all things, and through whom he made the universe. So Jesus, uh, he, Paul, uh, was involved. And in Ephesians 3, 8, 9, uh, Paul talks about uh, Ephesians Chapter eight, uh, chapter three, verses eight to nine. I mean, he said, <clears throat> eight, Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach the, to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of His mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who, co who created all things. So it is exciting that Genesis chapter 1 about creation, and then Hebrews about creation, and then Ephesians 3, 10 is about creation. So how do these verses reveal the unity of the Godhead? That the God the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, the God the Son, and the Holy Spirit was involved in the creation story. And compared to John 10, 17, it says, the resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrate the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, Jesus Christ in 10, 17, John 10, 17, that I have, you know, I have the life, I am the life. And in, in Romans 8, 11, let's go in there, Romans 8, 11. He said, And the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead 
is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to the moral bodies. So if you notice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is involved, is united in this small group of, uh, you know, uh, entity in which Jesus was and is and, uh, you know, involved in the resurrection. So the same thing here. In creation story, in creation story, it involves the Godhead. In the resurrection or recreation story is the Holy Spirit, Jesus the Son, God the Son, and the, the Father is involved also. So it's an exciting uh, concept. And so uh, the first small group, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then the three persons of God, small group before creating the world, their purpose was to plan and carry out the creation of humans and their environment. And then they even designed an alternative plan in case human decided to move away from God, the plan of redemption. So uh, the, 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 the small in groups here is involved in the plan of salvation. We'll see how small groups gather in one with several purpose in mind. In God's case, their first gathering were planning meetings, and the next ones were forced in fulfilling a specific plan. And of course, uh, when besides every small group must have the main goal of winning souls for the kingdom of heaven. Because this is the model that God did in the, in the Trinity concept of a small groups, as we say, in human terms, it was, the main goal was to win back man into his fold when, just in case they commit sin. And it happened. So in a small groups in the scripture, in Exodus 18, 21 to 25, we know the story. Jethro, Moses was leading the Israelites out of, uh, you know, from Egypt to, to, to the promised land. And Moses was leading this huge group of people, but his father-in-law found something that needed, uh, you know, some adjustment. And in 18 verse 21 to 25, and said, uh, he said, here, I'm going to read again. Verse 21. But God, but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves that they will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men for all Israels and made them leaders as the people officials over thousands hundreds, fifties, and tens. There it goes. So uh, in, why was it so vitally important? Important in a sense to prevent stress and, uh, you know, and uh, to, pre uh, to avoid uh, uh, Il, uh, Moses' uh, strain. In Luke 6, 12 to 13, Jesus also invited uh, his 12 disciples what was Jesus' twofold purpose in calling the disciples and select them to be part of uh, uh, the group ministry? It is this, the first small group. He is, in the Old Testament, Moses was able men and Israel and made them, when Israel got out of Egypt, Moses divided the people in camps 
my tribes and tents. Later, Jethro suggested to expand this. And then each small group of 10 people was led by a devout leader. This group prevented various problems and helped to cultivate spiritual life of people and to build close and affectionate relationships. It was still an effective method of camaraderie, spiritual growth, and problem solving. Later, Samuel founded the schools of the prophets. They followed similar organization and goals to the group of Moses. So, uh, the, the first verse here, in, in the small groups, every individual in the camp of Israel became part of a group of ten led by godly official. The small groups were a place for problem solving, but they were also much more. They are a place of fellowship where problems could be prevented and spiritual life nurtured. They were places of visions where God, God's plan for Israel could be shared in groups like this. People could form tight and caring relationships that could help and involve walk through whatever issues were that they were facing. No question then, as well as now, people struggled with things that others could help them with. So small groups provide opportunities for warm, caring fellowship, spiritual growth, and problem solving. It is fascinating, exciting, I say, that small groups specialists tell us that the, the, the ideal size of group for interaction is between 6 and 12 people. This is exactly the size that both Moses and Jesus employed in forming their groups. So uh, in our Tuesday's lesson, organized for service. And uh, Paul is talking about body. Body, the church is a body. Why does God send new Christians to become part of a community? How does the body metaphor teach us an important truth about our Christian experience? So when Paul talks about the church as a body, and when we talk about small groups, it doesn't mean to say that we are going to separate from the main community. We are just an entity within the body. The small group is still attached to the church, and we must, we must remember that we are part of the whole body. And Paul said that, you know, the eye is important and the ear is important. And when I says I, oh, I have nothing to do with the ear, and the ear says he had nothing to do with <coughs> the eye, that's not the case according to Paul because both of them is important. When the foot says I have nothing to do with, the, you know, the head, and, and, and the head says, I have nothing to do with the, with the foot. Uh, Paul, in essence, really, uh, used the imagery of the body to describe organizational structure that the church, its member, has a valuable contribution to make in the body. We think of a human body, to recog we recognize that the different members or parts of the body are organized into system. Its member of the body does not function independently. The human body is made up of 11 systems vital to the effective functioning of the entire body. A few examples is digestive system, the circulatory system, the nervous system, and the respiratory system. Uh, picture this respiratory system as a small group with different members providing oxygen to the cells, including the nose, mouth, the larynx, trachea, and bronchi. The respiratory system brings life through its air passage to the entire body. You can, can you begin to understand why the Holy Spirit impressed the Apostle Paul to use the body as an illustration for the church? He states now that you are the body of Christ and members individually. Members organized into small groups, each contributing their individual gifts to the whole. Create a healthy environment 
for members to grow spiritually <coughs> and for the church to grow numerically. When you think of the human body, every member has a function and a role to play. Corinthians 12, 20, 12, you know, 20 to 22 makes this point emphatically. But now indeed there are many members that yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor the, again to the feet, head to the feet, I have no need of you. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Every member of the church is vitally important. Each one has gifted for service within the body. Small groups become the vehicle that God uses to focus the witness of each member for the good of the entire body. Remember that when we discuss about the gift, it is for the edification of the church and these interrelated groups with varying roles and responsibilities provide the foundation of a healthy church. Involvement in a small group foster Christian commitment, responsibility, and accountability. Christianity is not a solo act. We are Christians in community, contributing by using our gifts in and for the community. So uh, that's how important it is for us organized uh, for service. And in our uh, organization, uh, we can say that human body is made for individual cells, but they are interrelated and work together harmoniously. The church is a body of Christ and works in similar way. When each person is part of a small group, it's harder to get this or discouraged and easier to fulfill our mission. And there are steps and this group are organized in a way that each person can make most of their gifts to help the body growing and fulfilling the mission. Uh, so we see in this organization that we are supposed to belong to a body, not disconnected. Doesn't mean to say that when we organize a small group that we are going to be disconnected from the main community though. Our small groups will enhance the whole body. In our Wednesday's lesson, New Testament small groups, Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. Let me read Acts chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome, Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. And so uh, here, the synagogue was, uh, you know, a small group of people uh, gathering together during the early Christian church. Why do you think Luke listed some of the names in those home Paul worked closely? Like uh, Priscilla, like Aquila, like uh, Claudius, because they are uh, new converts uh, meeting in small groups. And then in Acts 16, uh, 11 to 15, 16, 11 to 15, from, to our, from through us, we put, all, we put out to sea and called straight to Samothes. And, and the next day, on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city in the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there for several days. On the Sabbath day, we went out to the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. So if you notice, there was no church building here. Paul was 
going into a place near the river where the women are gatherings. And so th these were small groups. Uh, what invitation did Lydia give to Paul immediately after the conversion? And where did both Paul and Peter go after being delivered from prison? They went to the small group of people. So here we can notice that the idea of uh, uh, and in the New Testament is that in Delhi, in the temple and every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as Christ. And Jesus established the first small group in the New Testament by choosing the 12 apostles. And then they were taught and trained in practical ways on how to use their gifts to effectively preach the gospel while growing spiritually. The heart of the early church was small groups who gathered at homes. And we already read those. And they also organized small evangelization groups. They supported each other with their personal experience to fulfill the missions. Thanks to the groups, the gospel quickly spread through their known world. Because in the small groups, they testify about God's goodness, of God, God uh, that uh, blessed them. And then on Thursday, we talk about small group dynamics. So small group dynamics. <clears throat> if you notice, uh, in the New Testament, uh, here are some, let me go back there first. Uh, in the New Testament, some practical examples in the book of Acts uh, had been given. So in a small group dynamics, it says, Acts 4.31, let me read, Acts 4.31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God. If you notice, the context of this is the disciples were praying together, small group of people. Acts 12.12, 12, they were praying. In Acts 12.12, 12, <clears throat> said, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary. No, Acts 12, 12. And, and Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many, where many people had gathered and were praying. So they were praying. In chapter 20, verse 17 to 29. From Miletus... Paul sent uh, to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know that I live the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. So here you know that they have in Paul's Acts 20, Verse 7 and then 27 to 32, he said, 27 to 32, For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flocks of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. By be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will rise and destroy the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be, your, so be on guard. Remember that for these three years, I never stop warning each of you night and day with tears. So, uh, and in verse 2, Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. Let's build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So those are the contexts. If you notice, we list all the different elements in the New Testament groups. What activities? And so I'd like to, the dynamics. So when he had considered, he came to the house of Mary and John, 
a certain work where many were gathered together praying. And God uses small groups to make the church grow by nourishing faith of the believers, nourishing faith of the believers, and teaching them how to t- t- testify about Jesus. So here are some practical uh, you know, uh, examples of the book of Acts in chapter 6 were being you know, neglected in the daily distribution of food. The issue potentially could become so divisive that it might have been torn apart by the church. How was the problem solved? A small group called Deacons was established to meet and seek good of the body. In Acts 6, the apostle organized the gospel medical missionary team, including Luke and Paul's young protege Timothy to evangelize Greece. And churches established in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Corinth testify to the effectiveness of their work. There are three kinds of small groups. Acts 6, group of work that work primarily within the church, Acts 12, prayer group, and Acts 16, evangelistic group. So, one of the things that we must extremely be careful about organizational of small groups is thinking that every group must be the same. In the New Testament, there were different groups meeting different needs, performing different ministries for the good of the whole. Each group was involved in prayer, in fellowship, in the ministry of the worried, based on gifts of the members. Some groups were predominantly care groups that ministered within the body of Christ, while other groups were predominantly mission groups that focused on winning lost people to Christ. So he... Every group has the main goal of leading people to Jesus. Although each group may have different dynamics according to specific goals, here are some of the examples. Interceding for others. We talked about intercession a few weeks ago, uh, you know, and so very powerful one. And then we talk about praying for common concerns, praying for uh, the, uh, you know, people uh, you know, sometimes we do this in the midweek prayer uh, where people uh, request for, please pray for somebody. Pray for my loved ones. Pray for my friend. You know, these are common concerns. And then spending quality time together. This is one of the key success in the small groups is that we be, develop a quality time together and we know, uh, you know, Talk about the success and the failures, uh, you know, ups and downs of our daily living. And at the same time, study the Word of God. We study the Word of God to improve our knowledge of God and who He is. And then, training for service. We cannot just simply pray and then study the Word of God. We need to train. There are people there who doesn't know how to, you know, be a witness for Jesus Christ. But training within a small group is more effective because it is a one-to-one situation, you know, something like that. And then learning how to share the gospel is the key, is, is the, and then doing community service is, and participating in missionary activities. There are some, uh, the, the, so this is not a complete list. Each local church must plan their best small groups with specific goals according to their peculiarities. And I'm going to thank you for peculiarities. <laughs> okay? I hope that, make, that makes it uh, clear. So, the question is, in our Friday's discussion, why is it so important that small groups keep on outward mission focus. That is, however much a group can help nourish and support its members, why must it always keep central to its purpose, the spreading of the gospel? Uh, So if you notice, way back uh, in Jesus' time, he called the 12 disciples, they prayed together, 
they, they learned about the Bible. They studied, and, you know, asked Jesus questions, difficult questions, easy questions. And then after that, Jesus trained them how to do the, you know, missionary activities. And why is it that important? Because that is important. That is the, the mission that we are involved in. So, in my summary uh, here, the harvest is great, according to Matthew, but the workers are few. In our discussion, you know, our surrounding community, there are people there. It's exciting because if we study, if we remember in a few discussions, few weeks, Sabbath ago, few Sabbaths ago, that the Holy Spirit is preparing people in our community. And the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit guide us into that person. The Holy Spirit also prepares us. And the small group has, a, a, you know, a, a, a part of this, uh, training us into that. And we are impressed and we are prepared because we have the knowledge of the Bible and uh, the, the good news. Then we are ready to you know, see the workers are few. That's why we need small groups to train, uh, you know, for service. And then small groups exist to lead people to Jesus, nurture their faith in Jesus, and equip them to witness for Jesus. This is the core suggestions that why we need to have a small groups in our church. Lead people to Jesus, nurture their faith in Jesus, and equip them to witness for Jesus. And we can do this effectively in a Christian homes. Can be a great centers of influence. You know, uh, uh, our home can be a, you know a, a place where we can be comfortable. We can be able to you know study the Word of God, pray together, and, and be able to uh, a center of influence. Small groups are the heart of the churches. It is. Uh, we, because without the heart beating, uh, we will, we will, uh, the church is going to uh, die down later. In fellowship with Him, they would grow in grace. So, small groups is not only about socializing, it's not only about praying, it's not only about study the Bible, but fellowshipping. Because when we fellowship with Him, they would grow in grace. Our fellowship should be Christ-centered. It's not about us, ourselves, but it's about we connect in our group fellowship uh, about Jesus Christ. And soul winning is the ultimate goal of our small groups. This is the goal. Soul winning is the ultimate goal of our small groups. So in my last quotations here, the blessing of the Lord will come to the church members who thus participates in the work, gathering in small groups daily to pray for its success. Thus the believers will obtain grace for themselves and the work of the Lord will be advanced. And then the last quotation is, Yet little companies met together to study the scriptures you will lose nothing by this, but will gain much. Angels of God will be in your gatherings, and as you fed upon the bread of life, you will receive spiritual sinew and muscle. You will be feeding, as it were, upon the leaves of the tree of life. By this means, only can we maintain your can you maintain your integrity. And so that is our lesson uh, presentation today. And I hope that uh, uh, you will learn more about this. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, email me, my uh, sonekoj at aol.com, and we will discuss outside of this uh, presentation. And I wish you are here, but uh, you are not, so uh, let's close with a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for uh, 
your blessing us helping us to be able to present this uh, Sabbath collision not only for the church but for outside of the church may it be that this will bless people who are going to try to develop a small group fellowship in their own community because it is modeled upon your methods when you were here. Thank you so much, Lord, for that blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.